three times so far. Three times so far, the moons of Jupiter have exploded our understanding of the whole universe. I want to talk to you today about the Galilean moons. These are the four big moons of Jupiter. They're basically planets they just happen to not revolve around the sun, and I'd like to talk to you about it without thinking about Pluto. But I can't. Because I don't want to be mean to Pluto. Pluto is a good planetary body. It's a dwarf planet and it kicks ass. And we called it a planet for a long time because our understanding of the solar system was incomplete. And now people think about Pluto all the time as if it has been wronged when, in fact, the four Galilean moons, and in indeed other moons and dwarf planets in the solar system, are far more slighted by having never been thought of by people, despite the fact that we have learned ridiculous things about our universe that you would never think we could have learned about our universe from a moon. I'm wearing a shirt of them that I commissioned an artist to make for me. Okay? That's how much I love these moons. They are so deeply underappreciated. We got Jupiter here in the middle, and then in the middle of the red spot, there's, this is Jupiter, and these are the four moons. And then this one's Io, this one's Europa, this one's Ganymede, and this one's Callisto. I love being me. Uh, I could do stuff like that. I'll link to the artist, Casey, in the description, and I'll also link to where you can buy it in the description. And I am going to give you a quick primer on each one of these moons, but first I want to tell you two ways, there's a third one that'll come later, that these moons completely changed our understanding of the universe. And I mean that, like, in a world shaking way. And it's the first one is going to be a little hard for us to get our heads around. So the Jupiter system is also called the Jovian system. You can think of it like a mini solar system with like a failed star in the middle. So Jupiter could have been a star, but it's not big enough. And if it were, these would be the four planets of the Jovian system. Just like Earth is one of the seven planets of the solar system. Sol being the name of our star. And these moons are big. One of them is bigger than Mercury. All of them are bigger than Pluto. They're big enough and close enough that you can see them with a pair of binoculars. So Galileo was able to see them with a pretty crappy telescope in the year 1610. Initially, he figured that these were just like some stars that were nearby Jupiter he couldn't see with the naked eye, but there was something very weird about these stars. They were not staying in the same place while Jupiter moved past. They were moving along with Jupiter. And people wanted to explain this in every possible way that didn't imply that there was something going around something that wasn't Earth. Because at the time, the thing that everybody believed and wanted to believe was that everything went around the Earth. The moon went around the Earth, the sun went around the Earth, all the planets went around Earth, and Earth sat there in the middle of the universe. And why not, you know? Why not think that we're the center of the universe? That's how we all feel about ourselves. Astronomers kept trying to prove him wrong. Johannes Kepler thought he was full of it, ended up being one of the biggest defenders of it after looking at it with his own telescope and doing his own measurements. Same thing happened with the Jesuit astronomer, Christoph Scheiner. He argued Galileo was just seeing things, like it was an optical illusion. But then he built his own telescope and he saw them too, and he was like, oh my god, Galileo was right. And this, of course, seems like less of a big deal to us now. But the fact that anything was going around anything else was a big, hint in favor of maybe the Earth is going around the sun. So these four moons were a big part of Galileo's argument that, like, Aristotle's view of the solar system with the Earth at the center was wrong. And in fact, it was the Copernican way, which went against the teachings of the Catholic Church, which you shouldn't really think of as a church. You should think of it as like a uh, theocratic megastate that controlled what you were allowed to believe. And when I say allowed, I mean Galileo spent the last eight years of his life under house arrest, but did manage to not be killed, which is great for him. Not, it wasn't a given at the time. But you knew about Galileo, and you knew about the house arrest. You might not have known that the moons played such a big deal in it. And to them, that would have been a really big deal. But to you, a bigger deal is something that was discovered because of Jupiter's moon Io that you would never think happened because of Jupiter's moon Io. In 1676, so still a very long time ago, a Danish astronomer, his name was Ole Romer, I don't know how to pronounce it, he was doing something uh, that's just like normal astronomer stuff. He, like This is like the meat of astronomy is just like marking down when things happen. And one thing that happens as the moons go around Jupiter is they disappear for a second because they fall into Jupiter's shadow. They are eclipsed by Jupiter. The sun isn't hitting them anymore, so we can't see them anymore. And that happens super regularly because, of course, the movement of a celestial body is regular. But when Romer was looking at these numbers, something weird was going on. The eclipses kept running late, and they kept running later and later as the Earth and Jupiter were getting farther and farther apart. So sometimes Earth and Jupiter are on the same side of the sun, in which case is like that's when they're closest. Other times Jupiter is all the way on the other side of the sun, and that's when they're farthest away. And that's a big difference. There's a lot of space there. I don't know what the numbers are, but that's a big difference. And as Jupiter moved further away in its orbit, eclipses were happening later and later until they happened about 11 minutes later than they should have, and then it started moving back 
back to when it was supposed to happen. This happened over and over again. It was very observable, and there's only one explanation for that. There's only one thing that could be happening. And it's a very weird thing that we know now and that we sort of like accept now, but boy does it change everything about the universe. He was just annoyed by this inconsistency and he realized something incredible. We weren't seeing Io's eclipses when they actually happened. We were seeing them after the light from the event traveled all the way to Earth because light had a speed. But not only that, because we could actually calculate the distance between these planets pretty accurately. This is wild, like I can't walk you through how they figured that out, but they did. He figured out not only does light have a finite speed, it was about, his calculations, 220,000 kilometers per second, which is off from our modern understanding, like our measurement is around 300,000 kilometers per second, but that is so close! for 1676. He was using a telescope that was worse than a normal pair of binoculars and a pendulum clock. He proved for everyone to accept, there was no other explanation for this, that light doesn't travel instantly. I mean, people kept fighting about it for a long time, but this was pretty good evidence and people didn't really know how else to explain it. The moons that Galileo had discovered helped humans figure out one of the fundamental constants of the universe, which meant that if we were seeing things that were farther away, we were seeing back in time. Io showed us that we could time travel. <laughs> I always think I'm gonna start these videos out and I'm gonna be like the guy from Cool Worlds where he's like up on the mic and he's like calm and cool like Carl Sagan and I like halfway through I'm just like You fools are sleeping on the moons of Jupiter! <clears throat> okay, so now we know two of the three ways that the moons of Jupiter changed our conception of the entire universe. So now we're just gonna do a quick rundown of the cool things about these four moons. We're gonna move uh, from Jupiter out. And the first one we hit is gonna be Io. Io is extremely geologically active. It is constantly spewing its insides onto its outsides, remodeling the surface of the planet, covering it in sulfur, which makes it this like very vibrant orangey yellow color. It's the most geologically active body in the entire solar system. It has the biggest volcano in the whole solar system, which is wild because it is much smaller than Earth or Mars. Mars has the biggest volcano of any planet. Did I say there were like 400 active volcanoes on the surface of Io? This is not a place you'd want to go hang out, but it's extremely cool. It is a wild laboratory of what is possible on the surface of a moon. And this is weird because because Io shouldn't be active at all. It's small, and small worlds are supposed to be cold and dead inside because they've had all of like four billion years to lose all of their heat to space, and there's no reason why it would be so hot. But, and this is a pattern we're gonna see over and over again, Jupiter is tugging on it, and also its sibling moons are tugging on it, and so it's getting stretched and squeezed in tidal forces. It's being kept in place, so it's not getting tugged into the planet, but it's being stretched and unstretched and stretched and unstretched over and over again. And that introduces a tremendous amount of energy into the planet, a lot of friction, and it turned the planet into just a huge furnace, basically. And that is very cool. There's no other object like this in the solar system that has been so hot for so long. It is extremely unique. I mean, Earth is also unique, obviously, but it is unique in the solar system that helps us understand a bunch of stuff about how planetary bodies work. Moving next up, you're going to find Europa. And Europa is from whence we get the third complete revolutionization of our understanding of the universe. Obviously, liquid water is important. It's important for life. We have a very hard time imagining how life could happen without liquid water. There's other liquids out there, but they're just not like water. Water's so good at so much stuff. And as we got better and better at viewing the solar system, it was like, oh, Nothing else is wet. There's no liquid water on Mars. There's no liquid water on Venus. There's no liquid, like, there's all these gas giants. There's no liquid water on them. And it started to seem like liquid water might be extraordinarily rare in the universe. But in the 70s, in 1970s, <laughs> I feel like I had to say that for some reason. Voyager 2 flew past Europa and got, like, a good view of it. What we saw was a planet that was, one, made of ice, and two importantly, extraordinarily smooth. Now, you could have an ice moon and have it not have any liquid water anywhere on it. You could just have a solid block of ice. But if the surface is super smooth, and also you have these, like, cracks and chunks that uh, have these big fissures between those beautiful, beautiful planet. Oh, look at it. It's so pretty. Oh my god. What you know is that when, a uh, like, a big thing hits Europa and leaves a crater, that crater doesn't last long. Something's happening to replace that crater. And the the thing that it has is plate tectonics, basically. But except instead of like rock and rock, it's ice and water. So we are almost certain that what's going on here is that below the surface of the ice, 
there is a giant liquid water ocean. And I'm talking about an ocean that if you took it and put it on Earth, there would be no land. If you took all the water away from Earth and then you put Europa's water on Earth, there would still be no land. We're talking a very large subsurface ocean and we have other measurements that have indicated to us that one, it is salty. And that includes the fact that there's a bunch of salt on the surface of Europa because we think that Europa might be spraying water sometimes out of like geysers, like water volcanoes. And then that water is falling down to the surface of the planetary body of the moon. We're going to find this out, by the way, in 2030, when the Europa Clipper, which is already launched, arrives at Europa. It takes a long time, <laughs> in part because we just don't want to spend that much money. So we do all these gravitational assists to get the, ob the thing there and are like, well, you know, six years versus three, who cares? But the gravitational assists take time to fling it out all the way to Jupiter. So first of all, Voyager's view of Europa was our first hint that there was probably liquid water elsewhere in the solar system. We think that there's a bunch of other places where that is, all, well, we know Enceladus is the case for one of the moons of Saturn. We also think all of the Galilean moons except for Io have liquid water and in the inside of them, probably. But when you go from one planetary body in the solar system with liquid water, that means nothing. That could mean that it's extremely common. It could mean that it's extremely rare. To two, that means it's common. It might not mean that every planetary system in the galaxy has liquid water, but it means that a bunch do. So it's wild that Europa has a kind of plate tectonics. It's wild that it seems to have a salty ocean and also that there seem to be organic compounds on the surface. Now, I'm not saying organic as in made by life, organic just being carbon compounds. That's what we call them in chemistry. But what that means is that not only is there a subsurface ocean, probably. But also that subsurface ocean is interacting with rock. And also probably that rock has some volcanic geologic activity. And then you thus have like hydrothermal vents on the bottom of a giant ocean. And we think hydrothermal vents are one of the main candidates for how, like where life began on Earth. So our third complete reforming of how we imagine the universe happened because Europa was the first signal that there was liquid water elsewhere in the solar system. It could also provide us with the fourth. And I'm sorry that I'm talking so much about Europa, but I will talk a little less about the other two. But this is a big deal. And I want you to understand that when the Europa Clipper gets to Europa, there is a good chance it will be able to fly through some of these plumes, and it will be able to analyze the water that has been shot out of Europa. And if it is able to do that, it could find signatures that indicate life. And they're not, they don't want to talk about this because like it's, you know, you don't want to put your cart before your horse. But like there is a potential that the Europa Clipper will discover signs that are very indicative of life. And there's also a very strong potential that it will not discover that. And that won't necessarily disprove that there would be life, but it would be a sign that there might not be. But it would be, I think, cool if a Galilean moon gave us one more complete revolution in how we understand the universe. I'm just saying, because that would mean that life happened twice in one planetary system. Anyway, that's Europa. It might be my favorite. It's a pretty big deal. But we got to keep going. And so we're going to talk about Ganymede. Maybe I should have had a series of videos where I talked about each one of these moons. Jeez. So Ganymede is the biggest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than Mercury. If this moon was just a planet, people would love it. People would talk about it all the time. But it's not. It's a moon, so we ignore it. Wild thing, it has auroras because it generates its own magnetic field, which is very rare in the universe. It's the only moon that we know of that has one, and it is strong enough to actually protect it from Jupiter's massive magnetosphere, which tosses off a lot of radiation, which I'm not even going to get into right now. And people talk about Ganymede like it's a cosmic jawbreaker. We don't, we, like, we're still working on this, and we're going to know more about it pretty soon here. But it seems like at the very middle, there's almost definitely like an iron core, which is how it has its magnetic field. And then things get very weird. Above that, that is a layer of hot ice, which is, th is a thing that can happen. If water is under enough pressure, it can be both very hot and solid. So we call this ice three. It's not like the kind of ice that we have here on Earth. For example, it would sink in water. And then it potentially has multiple layers of liquid oceans sandwiched between layers of different types of ice. The lowest one being perhaps 800 kilometers down. Europa's ocean is probably like 20 to 30 kilometers down. So very deep. I, it's still 20 to 30 kilometers is very deep, which is, I should have mentioned, why we can't go and look. It's too thick. We, we, we tried to go to Mars and dig down like six feet and we failed. And that first ocean is probably salty and hot and has lots of minerals from the rocky layer below creating that kind of hydrothermal vent style environment. And that would be wild if there was life all the way down there. I don't know how we'd ever find it.
I don't know how we'd ever even get hints of it. But the surface, it looks a little bit boring, but it's cool, actually. It's got, like, these dark areas that are, like, basically right when the moon formed, and then it's got a bunch of icy areas, which are the lighter areas. Which has, like, glaciers the size of continents, and Ganymede also has a bit of an atmosphere, which is incredibly thin, but we think that it's just the, like, when it's in the sun, a little bit of the water vapor evaporates into the atmosphere, and then when it's dark, it recondenses on the surface. And finally, we got Callisto. Might look also like a bit of a boring sibling, but cool thing about Callisto is that it formed extremely early in the solar system, and unlike, because it's further out, unlike all of its other Jovian moon friends, it doesn't have all those tidal forces, so it has stayed locked in its shape for a very long time, which means that it surfaced, which you can see down here, it's just like covered, absolutely covered in impact craters. It's basically a record of every thing that has ever happened in the solar system. It formed early in the solar system and it has not changed since it formed. Every single impact that happened is recorded. It's like a palimpsest of the history of the solar system. A palimpsest is like a piece of paper that people like use over and over again and they like scrape the ink off and then they use it again, uh, which we used to do because paper was really expensive. But you can actually use a palimpsest to see multiple like layers of what people wrote on that piece of paper over time. And it's actually similar because later bombardments did cover up some of the early ones, but it's such a big moon there's actually space that we can see kind of the whole history of the bombardments, which is a big deal when it comes to understanding how the solar system initially formed. It's kind of like another way of looking back in time. Callisto is also weird because when most like big planetary bodies form, they have some time while they're still molten to differentiate a little bit, where like the heavy stuff goes to the center and then the light stuff goes to the surface. But Callisto, that didn't happen. It's all still mixed together, even in its outer layers. So like the moon never got warm enough to fully melt and separate out. Which is cool. We also think Callisto might be hiding a very large subsurface ocean. Like, it may be that Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa all have more liquid water than Earth does, which is... <laughs> it's hard. We don't know for sure. In the case of Callisto, though, we don't think it's heated by the tidal forces of Jupiter. Instead, it might be heated by the radioactive decay of the rocky parts of the planet, and possibly just by, like, a special kind of ice that traps all of the heat inside of the planet. We're going to know way more about all of this stuff soon because the European Space Agency's JUICE mission is on its way to study these worlds in detail to get, oh my god, it's going to be so good. This video, if I made it after these pictures come back, would be so much better, but I have to make it now so that you could be excited about those pictures coming in. And the Europa Clipper, which just launched last year, we're going to get to see, like, beneath the ice better. We're going to be able to map Ganymede's magnetic field. We might even find those weird isotope ratios I was talking about. Also, lots of good pictures. Trust me, lots of good pictures. I just, I love these moons so much, and I feel like we ignore, like, we spend so much time talking about Pluto because it, it feels like it got wronged, but the real objects in the solar system that have been wronged are the ones that we never paid attention to in the first place, despite how freaking amazing they are. And we are in a situation where already they have revolutionized our understanding of the universe three times, and they might hit us with a fourth. And of course I have a bias, we all do, toward the best possible story, and that would be the best possible story, right? I feel like the best possible story should be true, but of course that doesn't mean that it would be. So probably they'll hit those isotope ratios and be like, ah, oh, normal, natural isotope ratios, nothing weird, nothing to see here. But what if? What if? There's a link in the description where you can get this delightful Galilean moon shirt. It looks very cool and you can celebrate these moons and tell people all about them whenever they see your shirt. Because now you know that there are things in this solar system that are way cooler than anybody is aware of. Just because they're moons, I believe that we should be thinking about planetary bodies, not about planets. We should be thinking about dwarf planets as cool planetary bodies and we should think about all these cool rocky moons around Saturn and Jupiter as amazing planets bodies. Mercury? Come on! There's nothing going on there! So celebrate them with me, and thank you to Casey for designing this dope shirt so that I can celebrate them too. There's a link in the description.